Hello everybody, Professor Nagy here. Uh, we are going to talk about map types and styles today. So it makes sense in the context of GIS that we'd be talking about styles of maps and types of maps because you're in your learning of GIS, you're gonna be making tons of maps, right? So you have to have some map literacy uh, and some map vocabulary to go along with that. So that is the topic for today. All right, uh, reference and thematic maps. And so cartographers make many different kinds of maps. And, and as GIS analysts, GIS technicians, uh, uh, using mapping technologies, you are considered a cartographer. Um, but the different map types can be divided into two broad categories. We've got general reference maps, and then we have thematic maps. General reference maps show general geographic information about an area. Uh, there are things that you, know, you usually see them uh, at road maps, for example. Uh, they include the locations of cities, boundaries, roads, mountains, rivers, and coastlines. Um, government agencies, such as USGS, make some general reference maps. If you haven't taken a look at USGS yet, um, I suggest that you uh, spend some time, maybe pause here and uh, do a Google search for USGS, and then you can take a look at some of those maps. Most of USGS maps are topographic max, maps, meaning they show changes in elevation. Um, I'll, I'll tell you, you know, kind of dating myself here that uh, before GIS became widespread, um, I would have to go up to the uh, USGS store. Uh, it was kind of like a, an associate bookstore on campus. And that is where we would go, uh, my backgrounds in urban planning. Uh, so we would have to go to the map shop um, and pick up uh, USGS maps all the time to do our work because we didn't have the capacity to be able to use GIS like we have today. Um, so just a fun little story there. Uh, thematic maps, uh, alternately, they display distributions or patterns over Earth's surface. So uh, this is also one of the key components to a GIS. Um, is this idea of being able to layer information on top of each other um, or with each other in order to distinguish distributions or patterns. Um, typically, they emphasize one theme or topic at a time. Um, it can be more than one, uh, but typically these distributions or patterns that are being shown is typically an emphasis of one particular pattern or distribution. But again, that's it's not limited to that. But these themes can include information about people, other organisms, or the land. And so this idea of themes, uh, layers, different types of information that you can uh, marry with other types of information to see if there is a relationship between, uh, let's say, ground cover um, 20 years ago and ground cover today. Um, that you can look at a series of maps to see, well, let us see how this particular uh, uh, growth uh, or land cover has changed as a result of urbanization. So you see them adding the element of urbanization. And so land cover is going to change in areas that have been uh, developed, urbanized, um, or, or the other way around in which things are being uh, deconstructed or things are being knocked down in terms of structures um, or changed in order to see what the impact of those things are over time. And so over time, that's dynamic, that's a pattern. Moving to the next, we're gonna focus a little bit more on the general reference maps now. They're simple maps. Um, they're intended to show important physical features in an area. And so features uh, here are natural and man-made. Uh, their main purpose is to summarize the landscape to aid discovery of locations. So really what that means is you're trying to find out more information about that landscape uh, for your travels, for your research, for your study, and they're usually easy to read and understand. Uh, most of the early mapping of the earth falls into this group uh, because it didn't have um, it didn't have these distributions or patterns. Um, it was more of an observation of what we see around us, um, and those are those features. General reference maps often enlarge or emphasize some features to aid the users, and the user meaning the map reader. And so, for example, road maps show boldly. Um, and may use road widths and color to distinguish between major and minor roads. So you're seeing a little bit of the use of graphics um, in being able to display information. So when you're looking at a road map, for example, you may see interstates as a uh, thick gray line. You may see streets um, within a neighborhood or a city um, separated, let's say, boulevards 
versus um, smaller side streets, that those may be also distinguished by the width of the line or a particular color that's associated with that line. Um, again, I'm just using roads as an example. Um, general reference maps also usually only show relief, uh, the difference in height between features on the map in a stylized manner, but it's not surveyed for accuracy. So again, when we were talking about surveying last time, um, it is literally a mathematical uh, uh, and measurement type of exercise, um, whereas scale is important for ge general reference maps. It's not usually down to uh, the uh, large scale level, uh, like you might see in a map that you make with Google Maps or something like that. Physical maps, a uh, type of uh, general reference map. The definition of a physical map is a description of the geographical features of a location. Uh, sounds pretty simple, right? They indicate landforms like deserts, mountains, lakes, and plains. Um, again, those are like larger uh, types of features and they are, I think they're really more phenomena uh, because they're large. Um, they are things that uh, you can find distinguishing features between a desert and non-desert, mountain and, and plain. Uh, lake versus land, things like that. And their topography style provides a complete picture of the local terrain and a physical map displays the natural landscape characteristics of an area. Again, this is um, natural landscape and that's, that's typically associated with a physical map. Um, there really isn't a lot of information like let's say how many buildings are on this street or um, there may be something significant like a landmark uh, or something historical but typically it's not about what has been built um, and what those uh, the man-made features on top of the natural features. Topographic maps. Um, it's not like a physical map because it indicates different physical landscape features. They show the true lay of the land, including streams and these other natural elements, but they also display important landmarks and roads. Um, where I'd mentioned that there could be a landmark in your physical map, they're typically uh, you see more of those uh, kind of distinguished individually on a topographic map. Um, and they're, they're different because they use contour lines rather than colors showing changes in the land. And so contour lines um, are elevation changes. Um, and the closer the lines are together, the steeper the terrain, the farther those topographic, uh, those elevation lines are, the uh, less uh, uh, significant of a slope uh, is happening in that, in that area. Um, you can use these maps for a variety of reasons. Um, typically we use them for camping, hunting, like leisure activities, um, but you can also use them for urban planning, resource managing, and surveying. Uh, they're typically uh, kind of your most uh, widely used base maps. Uh, you wanna know uh, what is there to begin with before you start layering on all this other stuff that you might wanna know. And so um, a, a general reference map, a, a physical map, topographic maps, um, these are um, pro not so much in Google Maps because you can't see elevation um, in Google Maps, but um, they are typically more physical maps. However, they do include, um, and it's scale dependent, more uh, man-made features. Political maps, uh, another type of reference map, uh, they are made to show governmental boundaries. Um, we're talking uh, boundaries between nations, states, counties, cities, and towns. Uh, there might be some physical features that kind of stand out as really significant about uh, or associated with the politics of a place. Let's say a river separates two um, administrative or political uh, as a political boundary between two places, for example. Like I'm thinking of Ohio and Kentucky in which the Ohio River um, is a dividing line between those two states. Uh, the characteristics of a political map uh, is a simple uh, is simple to use uh, is simple to use and it has a detailed index. So it'll tell you what all the things mean on it. Those are your keys, your uh, your legends. They'll typically not indicate much topographic features, particularly elevation. Um, it's just focused on national and state borders of a region. Um, they may also include key cities and significant bodies of water, like the example I gave you with the Ohio River uh, between Ohio and Kentucky, uh, but it's according to the details in the map, wh what's happening in that particular area. Although some physical features show up on political maps, it is really only to provide geographical reference, um, indicating uh, these physical features are there and they are kind of part of uh, the landscape of that area. 
interesting to note here is that the boundaries, the political boundaries that are on there, uh, on these maps, um, are usually based on people instead of the natural world. So we as people, as human beings, um, have created these boundaries. It's an administrative thing. It's a municipal thing. It's typically affiliated with the government um, or some governance body as we have created a boundary uh, uh, around our service area. And so it's a human endeavor, but we have made it a quote unquote feature of our maps. And so you see again how we uh, as humans have um, taken something that isn't really physically there in some cases and created it to be a political physical boundary between places. Cadastral maps, um, they are plans which map out individual properties providing details such as boundary information when houses or land uh, is surveyed and can be combined to build bigger cadastral maps. And so we're talking a little bit more about surveying, uh, what are the boundaries of my property or this property or that property. Um, and they are among the earliest types of mapping. Um, remember when we were talking about um, some of the ancient uh, maps, ancient cartography, uh, in which they were talking about um, surveying, accurate surveying, um, being able to establish administrative boundaries. Um, and uh, in this case, uh, the example here, the ancient Egyptians created cadastral records to establish ownership of land after flooding from the Nile River. So they are, uh, again, kind of a base map, kind of a, a type of information that is uh, necessary to understand ownership. Um, and I think that's a really important thing. Cadastral comes from the word cadaster, meaning a public record, uh, survey or map of the value degree and ownership of land for purposes of taxation. That's, you know, you see cadastral maps in your um, auditor's files um, that you can find through some of the public GISs that are out there. What are the boundaries of my property? And then what tax rate do I pay on that? Um, and they're typically prepared by surveyors and engineers, not typically GIS analysts, however, because um, these types of, uh, because cadastral maps are no longer a specialty, it's really the information that's within them that may be the specialty. So you may not know surveying, for example, but you may be asked, hey, can you enter in this survey to our GIS? So you may be learning a little bit of engineering lingo and surveying uh, lingo um, in doing this kind of mapping or working in a department um, or office that works with cadastral maps. Other types of reference maps, we have navigational and schematic. Uh, navigational, typically, you know, how do we get from point A to point B by road, water, or air? Um, I suppose you can do that by trails as well. Um, street navigation shows transit routes according to built road networks. Bathymetric shows depths of water and approach uh, approaches to channels, um, approach channels to ports and fishing. It's really about um, being able to see the depths of water, not necessarily the purpose, but more of to get a sense of um, how deep is this area um, and comparing that to um, uh, the land that may be around it, but in particular uh, associated with water, oceans, rivers, lakes, things like that. And then we have aeronautical navigation maps. They show air routes, airports, approach areas, keys and shoals. Um, one of the things I, I remember a couple years ago, I went to uh, Nova Scotia for a wedding and I remember uh, on the plane, watching uh, the little uh, travel ticker. They had a little map uh, that was available for us in the plane that showed you know, our, our progress on our trip, like where the plane was, and it followed um, uh, a curved line. Um, and you might ask, well, why is it a curved line? Because we're on planet Earth, right? We are on a 3D, uh, we are on a globe. Uh, so this, I thought it was really interesting in that their aeronautical map um, showing our route uh, was based on uh, the globe and not a flat map. Interesting thing. Uh, we have schematic maps. Uh, they show a schema of a system, and those can be uh, not necessarily limited to roads here, but subway, bus, trolley, cycling, or pedestrian. But we can also think of different kinds of systems or networks too, such as um, uh, water and sewer pipes, um, we can think of utility system where power lines uh, are going, um, cable lines, things like that. 
Um, there's also um, schemas of organizational systems, like where are all of my uh, faith-based or religious centers in the city that is a network of faith-based organizations? Where, is, where are all of our governmental institutions? Where are all of our historical institutions? Those are a schema of sort because you see that they are, they have a, they are a network in themselves. They're located somewhere, but within a particular area. And so that being able to see those locations, you might be able to see some patterns that come out of that. Um, it's not necessarily getting to the thematic maps quite yet, but you can see um, patterns of uh, maybe, you know, where things have been built uh, in a certain period of time. Um, maybe there's a, a agglomeration of um, network points um, in a particular place. Um, another example here is tourist routes. Um, something that I also will point out, let me see what's on my next one. Before we go to thematic maps here, I want to also acknowledge mental maps. Um, not on the slide, but mental maps are our ways, our individual ways of creating order and sense out of things that we know where they are. Um, and so we create a lot of mental maps for ourselves um, as we travel, particularly as we're getting used to a particular area. We, we think of different cues uh, that might um, indicate we're going in the right direction or the wrong direction, or I shouldn't take this route, maybe I should take that route. Uh, but mental maps, you know, one of the things that I uh, usually do in class here is I ask students and I give everybody paper and markers is to draw their own maps, draw a map of your neighborhood, draw a map of uh, a place that you're familiar with um, and see what kinds of things you include on that map. They may not be the same kind of things that are on the Google map or the Bing maps or whatever mapping platforms that you have. And so mental maps serve a purpose. They serve a purpose in terms of our individual understanding of in spatial thinking, like where are all these things, how close and how far, are they tall, are they short, um, what's the orientation, are they facing east, west, north, south, um, and so mental maps can be really helpful and useful as a way to introduce uh, uh, map features, uh, things that haven't been mapped yet, things that are important to include on maps, but maybe we've neglected them in widespread or, or bulk distribution of internet mapping technology. So I just wanted to throw that in there as uh, mental map maps count too. Um, they're not necessarily thematic until you make them so, but they're typically some sort of reference map in your mind um, that makes sense of geographic information um, that's important to you. Now on to thematic maps. So these are maps which depict information on a particular topic or theme. Again, this idea of um, distributions, patterns. The detail portrayed on a thematic map may be physical, statistical, measured, or interpreted, and sometimes requires specialist knowledge by the map user. Um, and that is, um, again, let's say statistical information. Um, one of the things before you move on to GIS methods, I believe um, you have to have a basic statistics course. Um, and that is so that you can um, use your statistical knowledge um, in map creation. So if you were showing, let's say, percentage population change um, over 10 years, you have to have some background in statistics to be able to uh, understand that and be able to convey that through your maps and so that the user, the map reader, can understand what you're doing. In a typical stylized thematic map, the map itself is secondary to the information being supplied. And so the intent is to quickly give an impression of relative differences and the detail being supplied as tables within the map. This is something that you're going to see within the GIS is that there is the map, the graphic map interface where you see like the colors and the shapes and the size of different features. But in the background, there are tables, um, a lot like Excel tables. Uh, they're not Excel, they're just generic database tables. But that is how we capture attributes of those things. Um, and when we get to when we get to the software, you're going to see some examples of this and you're going to I'm going to refer back to do you remember when we were talking about um, details um, of information? I'm going to refer to this. The number of themes is really limitless, uh, but the theme must have a geographic unit by which it's measured. Um, example here, population density, crop growth, voting preferences, they all have a geographic unit by which to calculate or compare. And those geographic units can be determined by you, but they can also be determined by our political maps and those political boundaries. So what is the 
uh, where is the boundary of um, our uh, Cuyahoga County um, and uh, where does it stop and where does it start? Um, if you're counting things within the county, then that county boundary is a container in which that information falls within that container. And how are you describing the information that's included in that container? Um, there are lots of different ways to do it, but the way that you do it within the GIS is typically by way of the attributes that are associated with the graphic. Um, so the tables in the background and the graphics in the foreground. Um, but it's important to understand geographic units. And so not to be misunderstood or, or uh, confused with scale, but a geographic unit is a measurement unit. You know, how do we compare things? Um, and we do that by way of units. So if we're comparing um, Cuyahoga County to um, Lake County, for example, those are two different geographic units. Not to say that there is going to be any significant difference in the type of data that may be displayed or studied within those units, because we can look at population density county by county. We can look at crop growth county by county. We can create our own boundary. Maybe you don't want something at the county level. Maybe you don't even want something at the municipal level. Maybe you have an idea for this specific unit, this area, this geographic area. I'm going to create my own district on this map. I'm going to draw a square or a triangle or some sort of shape that becomes my unit of measurement. Everything within that particular boundary is a unit. And so I want you to start thinking of it that way, that all the things that you see um, within a map are these different units and they have information within those units and that's how they're measured. And again, when we get to the software, you'll start to see this. Um, you probably see this to a certain extent with Google Maps um, because the, I believe they show some boundaries, um, maybe some it's limited, but let's say like they show the boundary of um, CSU campus. Um, it's kind of embedded within the map. It's not a separate feature per se, but again, when you are working with a GIS rather than an internet mapping technology, and we'll talk more about the distinctions between the two later on in the semester, um, but you would create those kinds of things. And so just understand that if you're counting things, you have to have a unit by which to measure, and that is the geographic unit. There are different types of thematic maps. We have choropleth, uh, most popular. Uh, those uh, choropleth maps are what we see a lot of. Um, they use different shading and coloring to display the quantity or value in defined areas. So I was talking about those geographic units. So let's say population density um, is higher in one particular place than another. You would show that by displaying that information um, as a change in color. Uh, different colors associated with different values, for example. Um, often the case, the map maker uses a type of data classification to produce its own choropleth map. Each data classification method impacts the reader differently. We'll talk a little bit more about data classification schemes later on. Um, it's best used when data are standardized, um, uh, such as rates, for example, or percentages. Um, they're standardized, they're discrete, and are evenly distributed within well-defined aerial units aerial units being those geographic units again. Uh, the number of categories and choropleth maps uh, should be limited to between three and seven. It's not a hard fast rule, but if you don't, if you have too much on your map, then you're starting to get cluttered, you're starting to get confused, and there's too much stuff there for the reader to be able to interpret. Um, types of thematic maps, another type is graduated symbol maps. Uh, they contain symbols varying in size to show their relative quantitative values. You can do this to a certain extent with qualitative stuff too, but let's focus on the quantitative for now. Um, it's typically used with point or location data. So let's say um, a good example is, let's say we're looking at cities within the state of Ohio, that a graduated symbol map, if you were to put different points on a map uh, based on the population of those areas, you'll have some areas with higher population and that'll be a larger point some places with smaller populations, that'll be a smaller point, and then different sizes within those that threshold or that range from lowest to highest. It's best used when there's a lot of variation and range in the data, and the goal is to show relative magnitudes of phenomena at specific locations. Um, it's also a good choice for count data, so you don't necessarily have to, you know, just use percentages, for example, but you could use the raw number um, of a population rather than percentages around the states if you were comparing. 
It should not be used for standardized data, such as racer percentages. Um, and, and that's mostly because it's hard to compare those things across different geographic units. It's possible, um, but it, it really shouldn't be used for it. So we'll talk more about uh, different type that will. Um, thematic maps data classification. So we talked a little bit about data classification in the last slide. Uh, most core pleth maps and graduated symbol maps employ some method of data classification. And the point is to take a large number of observations and group them into data ranges or classes. And that helps the map readers. Map readers often find a few well-defined classes are easier to understand than raw data. Since if done well, they help to simplify and clarify the message of the map. You know, why are you making this map? What kind of information are you trying to convey? And remember in the last slide, we were talking about um, classifications between three and seven, not to go over that number of, of seven different themes on one particular map. Um, and the reason why it matters um, is because how we group our data into classes is one of the most fundamental aspects of map generalization. And that's the process by which we simplify the real world to fit onto the page, to fit onto the map. And these small differences in how we do that can dramatically change the look of the map and thus its message. Um, one of the uh, books that um, I'll mention here is a, a really fun read um, is How to Lie with Maps. Um, I'm, I'm, I don't have it in front of me right now, but um, it was a book that I read a um, long time ago when I started with GIS. And it really helped me understand how you as a map maker can affect the message that's being communicated with your map and that you can lie with maps. Um, sometimes you may not even know you're lying with maps because you don't even know that you're doing it. Um, but it's important that to understand what types of information that you're conveying through your map and the data classification scheme can help you with that. And so in order to classify and display um, accurate patterns, one must understand the data you're working with before applying a classification method. So maps that use questionable classification methods are more than ineffective and they're misleading. So that's, that's lying with maps. And above all else, the goal of data classification is to put places with similar rates in the same class and separate places with very different rates into different classes with respect to GIS. Um, one way, uh, another uh, data visualization that you can use um, when trying to figure out how to best rep represent data classifications is a histogram. Um, histograms uh, and charts um, and, and um, graphs are typically part of GISs. And so I kind of think of it as a quote unquote cheat, where I say cheat, where you can go to that uh, part of the software window and you can create a histogram to see how information is being displayed and if it's really conveying an accurate message uh, uh, and if you have the right data classification scheme for that. Um, histograms, so we're talking about histograms, it's a type of graph that provides a visual interpretation of numerical data, and it does this by indicating the number of data points that lie within a range of values. So again, you can see the how statistics, basic descriptive statistics is important. Um, these ranges of values are called classes or bins. Um, we, I use classes more than bins, but I guess it depends on, you know, where you're working or what language you're speaking. Um, the frequency of the data that fall, uh, falls in each class is depicted using a bar, and the higher that bar is, the greater the frequency of data values in that class. Histograms and bar graphs are similar. Um, they, uh, histograms look a lot like bar graphs. Both types employ vertical bars to represent data. The height of a bar corresponds to the relative frequency of the amount of data in the class. Again, the higher the bar, the higher the frequency of data. The lower the bar, the lower the frequency of data but looks can be deceiving. And it's here that the similarities end between the two kinds of graphs. And the reason that these kinds of graphs are different has to do with the level of measurement of the data. On one hand, bar graphs are used for data at the nominal level of measurement. Bar graphs measure the frequency of categorical data and the classes for a bar graph are these categories. And on the other hand, histograms are used for data that is at least at the ordinal level of measurement and the classes for a histogram are ranges of values. And as you can see in here, I have lots of links so that if you need to go back and, and like, oh, I forgot what ordinal versus um, uh, uh, nominal is, you can look and, and refresh your memory. And another key difference between bar, bar graphs and histograms has to do with the ordering of the bars. Um, in a bar graph, it is common practice to rearrange the bars in order of decreasing height. However, the bars in a histogram cannot be rearranged. They must be displayed in the order that the classes occur. So we have a 
different types of data classifications for, for the purposes of um, this talk. Um, these, uh, I'll, I'll point out the most often used and the most often that you see in the software, that's equal interval, equal interval data classifications, divides the data into equal classes. And I give you some examples there, you know, uh, 10 units um, per class and works best on data that is generally spread across the entire range. Um, but caution, avoid equal interval if your data are skewed to one end or if you have one or two really large outlier values. Um, outliers in that case will likely produce empty classes, wasting perfectly good classes with no observations in them. So that means that you might have to find a different data classification scheme. Um, quantiles will create attractive maps that place an equal number of observations in each class. Um, example here, if you have 30 counties and six data classes, you'll have five counties in each class. The problem with quantiles is that you can end up with classes that have very different numerical ranges. Quantiles can also separate locations with very similar rates and group together places that have very different rates, which is very undesirable. So use a histogram to see if this is happening. Uh, two other here, uh, natural breaks and manual. So natural breaks is a kind of quote unquote optimal classification scheme that finds class breaks that for a given number of classes will minimize within class variance and maximize between class differences. One drawback of this approach is each data set generates a unique classification solution. And if you need to make comparison across maps, such as an atlas or a series, you might want to use a single scheme that can be applied across all the maps. And then finally, there's manual, just like it sounds like. There are many times we need to manually set one or the class one or all of the class breaks. That means that you know your data really well and it's not being represented in these other data classification schemes. And so you create your own. Um, an example is, are there important breakpoints that need to be hardwired into your class breaks? Does one of the class breaks need to be the mean? Is this map part of a series that needs the same classes across all the maps? Um, do any of the other methods get you close to a good solution that could be improved with a few slight adjustments here and there? And if so, manual is the way to go. As we talk about these types of data classifications and uh, data ranges and units of measure, now you can see why intro to data analysis is a prerequisite for the course. So types of thematic maps, uh, another types of dot map. Um, dot maps show the presence of a feature or occurrence and displays a spatial pattern and relative density. Individual dots can represent a single or multiple occurrences. Um, one way to describe this on a dot map um, is thinking about um, uh, an easy way to visualize this is where um, you have an apartment building. An apartment building may have just one address. Um, it is a single building, but it has a number of units within it. And so you have the option of placing a dot uh, to represent an address, um, but that one address could have, let's say 15 apartments uh, associated with it. And so that's a good way of thinking about uh, kind of how this idea of dots can represent single or multiple occurrences. Mm -hmm. Clearly that's not density. I mean, yes, an apartment building is a dense uh, uh, housing, but in terms of like population density. Um, but this gives you kind of an idea of how that looks. It's best used for count data, like the example I just gave, and it can show multiple data sets by using different symbols or colors requires additional tools sometimes to locate dots on the map. That's called geocoding. We're not gonna be doing uh, batch or large geocoding as part of this class, but geocoding is literally any place that has a location on the surface of the earth, you can represent with a point. And so geocoding is literally finding a point to match all of those locations. Um, you could have a point to represent um, every single um, XY coordinate. Uh, think of it in terms of addresses though. So you have a ton of addresses or a ton of XY uh, coordinate locations and you wanna put all of those on the map. Geocoding is the process to do that. Perceptual issues as well as design techniques such as dot size, value and arrangements should be considered in this. But when we start to make maps, you'll be able to see some of these things. Um, other types of thematic maps, uh, one, one additional example is an isopleth map, um, and it's a contour map that depicts smooth continuous information. Um, and continuous information is opposite from discrete. Discrete means that it has a 
pretty uh, straightforward end or boundary. But when things are continuous, phenomena like weather or pollution, there is not a clearly delineate, delineated boundary of that. Now, you could um, be able to delineate um, rain clouds from non-rain clouds, and that, that may be discrete, but it's always moving, right? Clouds are always moving. And so that is why it's con considered continuous data. These data points are depicted using lines that connect points of equal numerical value. Um, isopleth maps, they serve as an effective method for highlighting spatial patterns in the data, as opposed to de depicting discrete rates per enumeration data. So like that example of, uh, uh, let's say population, that's a discrete thing, population within a particular area. But let's say pollution in a particular area, that pollution doesn't stop right at the boundary of the county. Um, it may decrease or increase, and that's what makes it continuous. Uh, it doesn't end somewhere. If we're talking about air pollution, no, it just keeps getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It doesn't ever go away. Typically requires understanding of various interpolation techniques, and interpolation is where you kind of, um, not guess, but you are able to find kind of a, a middle ground uh, between things. So point A and point, a and point B, uh, you're trying to find the middle of point A, and point a and point B, and interpolation allows you to do that. Um, you can probably do that mathematically in your head, like what's what's the literal middle points between these two uh, uh, beginning point and end points. But interpolation is a mathematical way to do those things. Another type of thematic map, <coughs> excuse me, is a cartogram. Um, they're also known as density equalized map projections. Um, they use the spatial geometry of e each mapped area and that which distorts to depict an attribute other than land. So some of those things that are, again, patterns uh, or distributions, population and income are listed here. Cartograms exaggerate the size of the geography proportional to the statistic being shown. And specifically, the variable substitutes um, land area or distance, and they distort our view of mapping by breaking the golden rule, sacrificing geometry to convey information. Um, it's I have optimal uses here. Um, it's best accompanied by description of mapping techniques, um, and it can be constructed manually or digitally. You can do it, you know, by hand or digitally. Um, uh, one of, uh, I was trying to think of something, but I, I forgot what it was. Uh, design considerations, and the methods are complex and interpretation can be difficult. So that's something to keep in mind with a cartogram. Um, not used as, as widely as some of the other thematic map types. But again, just another example is a cartogram. Um, different kinds of cartograms. We have density equalizing uh, cartograms. They're your traditional cartograms. And density equalizing cartograms map features bulge out um, a specific variable. Again, that exaggeration of something. Features in non-contiguous cartograms don't have to stay connected. Um, they can freely move about from adjacent polygons and be resized appropriately. And because they can freely move around, the shape remains intact for non-contiguous car cartograms. The main difference between density equalizing cartograms is that it moves each feature centroid to avoid overlaps. So the centroid is the middle of that feature. Um, you can mathematically calculate the middle um, of a unit, a geographic unit um, or feature boundary. Um, and you do that to avoid overlaps. Um, one example, uh, uh, most widely known cartogram is the Dorling cartogram, and it uses shapes like circles and rectangles to depict areas. So uh, let's uh, imagine, well, one of the things, I'm, you're going to be doing some assignments in which you look up different kinds of maps. So um, I, I'm not giving you a lot of visuals here because I don't want you to use the visuals in the map for your assignment. but. The types of cartograms make it easy to recognize patterns. Um, it doesn't maintain the centroid and shape. And this means that readers may have difficulty understanding features in the map, which is one of the reasons why really uh, it's not used widely and widely dis dis uh, disseminated mapping. Because sometimes the interpretation of the map creator is different from what's being expressed in the map to the map reader. Uh, another type of thematic map is a flow map. 
Um, they show the movement of objects between different areas. Um, these types of maps can show things like the movement of goods, the number of animal species um, in a migration pattern, traffic volume, stream flow. Um, they can also show both qualitative and quantitative data. A lot of people like flow maps for that reason. Um, they usually represent the movement of goods, weather phenomena, people and other living things with line symbols of different widths. Um, and thus the use of lines on a flow map is similar to use of graduated symbols. You can make these lines bigger, smaller, different colors. Um, and flow maps can use and display uh, both qualitative and quantitative data. And so the maps usually display symbols of uniform width that just so movement with arrows for qualitative data. Um, it's a connection of some sort and it's not based on magnitude. It's like if we're talking about, um, let's say, a, a, um, a pattern of weather. Um, again, it's a connection of some sort, not based on the magnitude of that weather pattern per se, but more where it's going. Um, so again, flow. Different types of flow maps. We have radial, network, and distributive. Uh, radial show relationships between one source and many destinations and use separate lines radiating out from a starting point to show that movement. So let's say um, a good example of a radial flow map might be um, all the students that graduated from CSU and where do they move after graduation, let's say. So all the ones that stay in Cleveland, they stay in Cleveland and then uh, radial flow might show all those other cities and states and countries that graduates go to. But the destination point is the destination uh, or the source is um, Cleveland State or Cleveland and the destinations are all over the place. Um, another example is the network flow map and it shows the quantity of flow over an existing network or schema. Remember we were talking about networks and schemas um, earlier in this talk. These types of flow maps most frequently show transportation and communication networks. They show again which direction they're going, um, uh, which uh, um, how how big uh, that network is, um, where things might be flowing within and outside of a network, um, and lastly we have distributive. Distributive are maps that show relationships between a single source and many destinations, like a radial flow map. The difference is they often have a large single line produced from one source, and that forks into many smaller lines once they reach their destination. Um, a good, uh, again, a good one uh, example I could use here is um, a watershed map. Um, this shows the distribution of all of the rivers, streams, creeks, um, smaller um, water flows. And um, it shows uh, that they're all gonna be emptying into one source. Um, in our case, it's Lake Erie. So if we looked at Northeast Ohio watershed, um, that all of the all of those rivers and streams um, and creeks that they're flowing into each other, which then empties out into Lake Erie, one source as the desk like the destination. Um, but you can just flip that uh, kind of mirror image of the destination is actually the source in this case because it empties out into a place. Um, cartographic elements. So, you know, what kinds of things do we do we find on the maps? And because maps are the primary tools by which spatial relationships and geographic data are visualized, um, they therefore become important documents. And there are lots of key elements that should be included each time a map is created in order to aid the viewer in understanding the communication of that map and to document the source of the geographic information used. A few of the elements here, data frame, um, all, all, well, I don't wanna say all maps because there are people that don't make really good maps and there are also Cartographic elements are included are not included on a lot of digital mapping platforms these days. GIS is a little bit different, but when you are looking at something on a screen that's different from looking at a prepared map. Um, you may be looking at Google Maps, but it doesn't have the legend, it doesn't have a data frame, it doesn't tell you where the source of the geographic information comes. So th that's why it's important when you are going to be producing a map for some reason to have these cartographic elements. So again, the data frame, um, that is literally your graphic, your graphic of the geographic information uh, that you're trying to convey. Um, it displays the different data layers, all the different pieces of information that you're including on the map within that picture. And this section is the most important and central focus of the map document, hands down. People wanna see what you're talking about. The legend serves as the decoder for the symbology in the data frame. So all those different things that are in your map graphic, 
they're all different colors, the different shapes. Um, and so you need some sort of key to be able to distinguish that. Um, the key or legend provides that description detailing the colors, symbols, um, or categorization um, of your data classifications, for example, is put in the legend. Without the legend, the color scheme on the map would make no sense to the viewer. I don't even know what I'm looking at unless I have a legend, right? Only you know what you're looking at because you were the one that made it. Some other elements, title is important because it instantly gives the viewer a succinct description of the subject matter of the map. You know, what uh, the, the title quickly tells the viewer um, the subject matter and location of the data. Um, I have made a map and the map title is housing in the city of Cleveland. So I kind of know what to expect in that map then. We have a north arrow. The purpose of the north arrow is orientation and for the viewer to determine the, the direction of the map as it relates to due north. We're used to seeing maps made in which due north is on the quote unquote top. Um, most maps tend to be oriented so that due north faces the top, but there are exceptions to this and having the north arrow allows the viewer to know which direction the data is oriented. I mean, it's possible that north isn't going to be at the quote unquote top um, of your map, but most of your maps and most mapping platforms these days, including GIS's, orient it that way. You can manually change those things, but from a basic, uh, basic point of view, most of the time your north arrow is going to be on the top or your north, uh, the direction of north is going to be towards the top of your map. So a compass, um, compass rows. Um, now for more cartographic elements, um, scale, big deal, explains the relationship of the data frame extent to the real world. Scales or ratios. Um, it can be shown either as a unit to unit or as one measurement to another measurement. Therefore a scale, um, in this case, therefore a scale showing a one to 10,000 scale means that every one map, one paper map unit represents 10,000 real world units. So what's on your map represents reality in this mathematical way. Um, for example, uh, one to 10,000 in inches means that a measurement of one inch on the map equals 10,000 inches in real life. I apologize, my dog might bark here. The, deck, the second method of depicting scale is a comparison with different unit types. Uh, for example, one inch to 100 feet means that every inch on the paper map represents 100 feet in the real world. This ratio is the same as one foot equals 12 inches. In addition to text representation as described above, the ratio can be shown graphically in the form of the scale bar. Um, those are, that's, that's what I do is I usually use scale bars more than anything. Uh, maps are, that are not to scale tend to have an NTS notation, which stands for not to scale. Um, mental maps, for example, rarely are they to scale because they're coming out of your head. Um, uh, not a lot of published maps have the not to scale notation. However, um, scale may be something that's not as important and it depends on what you're mapping. But just the explanation of scale, I think is important or the uh, a discussion. <laughs> Sorry about that. I'm going to pause for a minute so that this isn't. All right. Sorry for that interruption there. More cartographic elements. Um, the citation portion of a map constitutes the metadata of the map. What is metadata? Metadata is data about data. It's the area of the map where explanatory data about where ex explanations about the data sources and and all these other geographic uh, representation information um, are placed. And just like you would be creating citations if you were writing a paper, we also have map citations, which help the viewer determine the use of the map for their own purposes. Um, so if, um, you know, when was the map made? Um, when were, what are the data sources? Where did they come from? Are they still available? Um, we'll talk about geographic coordinate systems and projections later, but that's also something, information that's included on the map. Other elements um, can be placed on the map to help the viewer, um, such as a border or inset map. Say that you are um, preparing a map of the Cleveland area for people that don't live um, in Ohio or, or any surrounding states. You might put um, a map of uh, the state of Ohio as an inset map with a dot indicating where Cleveland is, for example. So that's an inset map. They may not always be necessary. Um, 
and it depends on the scale and format of the map. Dog, you're killing me. Come here. Cartographic principles. So what makes a good map? When done well, a map is a vehicle, vehicle for effective communication, just like you read in the um, history of cartography. There are many cartographic principles to help guide effective map making. Um, geographic bounds are the extent of the ge geographic area mapped, and they'll affect a whole slew of cartographic choices from the map projection used to the data and symbology choices. The geographic area of the map should be restricted, restricted to the extent of the map's subject data. What that means is if you are preparing information, again, but let's say the city of Cleveland, then you shouldn't include um, the whole map of Ohio um, as your map view. I mean, that, that kind of takes away from the detail of Cleveland that you're trying to convey. Just an example. Um, background data elements. Um, there are two main reasons to include data on a map, to support the subject matter of the map and to provide orientation. It's important to choose data that is relevant and current to the map. Um, for example, choosing an out-of-date street layer for an area that has recently gone through um, development can be confusing. Um, we run into this a lot with Google Maps too, um, where you know something was knocked down and it isn't included as part of um, the Google Map view, and that is because of the data capture date. So um, knowing your data, this is about, again, knowing your data, knowing what's accurate, knowing what's there. You may have to use more than one source um, that maybe Google Maps isn't the only map that you should be using. Does it convey everything accurately? Um, another way, another thing about background data elements, cluttering the map with too much background data can lead to excess noise and dilute the actual message of the map. So you don't want too much stuff or else the reader's like, what am I looking at? Some other cartographic principles, symbolization, labels, um, choice of symbology can make or break a map. Color choices, line widths, icons, labeling, um, all affect the readability and the message of the map. Um, if, if your colors don't make sense, um, I mean, there's a little bit of design flavor there. Um, you may need to look at a color wheel. You know, what's a hot, warm color versus a cool color? Um, there are also some uh, color palettes that usually come with GIS to help you with that. Um, if you are colorblind, um, you should also consider shading um, or having somebody else look at your map. Um, labels. Now, while it may be tempting to label all features shown on a map, doing so can get in the way of other things. So it creates a cluttered looking map and may create confusion. If you have um, streets labeled, names of buildings labeled, names of forests labeled, things like that um, at a smaller scale, that can be too much clutter. So labels should be used sparingly to identify important things. Scale may be a factor when deciding what to label, because if you have a um, small scale map, that is too much stuff to label. If you have a large scale map, that's more appropriate. So consider the intended audience of the map when selecting design choices. A map aided, aimed at children might involve brighter colors and less complexity, and a general audience map might involve the use of terminology. A map with a potentially colorblind audience should not use contrast, should not contrast certain colors, for example, like I'd mentioned about um, shading. Some other cartographic principles, we have map layout, locator maps, and peer review. Uh, map layout is a choice in map orientation. Uh, this is literally portrait versus landscape, which, which fits better um, in terms of paper orientation, size of paper, um, and the placement of the map elements affects the visual appeal of the map. Um, locator map. Um, again, it's kind of like the inset map. Unless the map is aimed at a very specific knowledgeable audience or is of a geographic breadth, such as countrywide map or global map, it can be helpful to include the smaller inset maps. Um, it helps the further orient the viewer in placing the geographic context of the map. Something that you may not be thinking of is important, but just like you have papers and you have proofreaders, you should also have proofreaders or maps. And so peer review. Another set of eyeballs on a map, especially an important one, should automatically be a part of your cartographic process. Peer review on documents is a common practice. I show my maps to other people like, do you need, do you understand what I'm trying to say with this map? Um, I should say as little as possible and my map should speak for me. Um, I always show my map to somebody else. And I say, the color makes sense? Is there anything that is in the way? Do you get what I'm trying to convey here? And so I recommend this as a practice um, of showing other people just to get another perspective on what you're making. Always, what does this have to do with GIS? The output of a GIS is typically a map. 
Um, a lot of times you're going to be doing analysis within the system and may not be, be preparing maps for viewing, but the output of the GIS is typically a map of some sort included in reports. Um, we make posters, things like that um, for an audience. The creator needs to know what type of map best represents the information, so the types of maps that we talked about. The reader must be able to understand the information being communicated with few words. So again, using your um, symbology, using um, colors, using sizing um, is helpful um, in designing a good map. Whether the map is a standalone output all by, on its own um, or integrated into a full report or presentation, still the responsibility of the creator to produce a meaningful and accurate visual for the intended audience. Um, you can, you'll probably, well, I don't know if you will or not, but um, many of the reports and projects that I work on, I have to include a map of some sort, at least one. And so I do map preparation a lot. You'll find that you do this a lot too, and you'll, you'll do it more um, when you are using your GIS skills in a project or um, at the workplace or something like that, but being able to produce maps. Your boss says, I need a map of the bus routes um, in Cleveland area. Sometimes you can find that without making it yourself, and sometimes you may find data in like five or six different places in order to make a map of your own. So anyway, again, maps are the output that we see most often. You're not looking at just a, a mapping screen, um, you're looking at a product. And so because that is the output, that's why it's important to understand different kinds of maps, which maps convey um, different kinds of information, data classification schemes, how is data interpreted, how is data presented. And I mean, we use the word data a lot, but it's, I mean, it's representing information, right? And so a map product um, is typically the output and something that um, you should, uh, you will have as part of the software training this is making a good output map. I think that's the last slide. It is. Um, so um, I look forward to talking to you next time with our next topic. And um, I hope that you're having a good day, um, having a good week, and I'll talk to you soon.